Thank you, Sophia. And hello, everybody. Nice to be here. I hope you have in, enjoyed the conference so far. When I realized that I'm going to be the person between you and the cocktails, uh, I took some liberties for my presentation. Uh, uh, I'm, it might contain some provocative, even normative elements. But anyway, I think it's, uh, well, I can do so, so I, I decided to do so. Uh, uh, I picked up the metaphor of navigating, uh, and I'm trying to use it to describe uh, uh, what actually should be done. I'm not so much into analysis, what is the problem, and, and I, I, I'm trying to, in a way, design some instructions, what we should do in this situation. So this is basically what I'm trying to do, and, and I have this kind of, of navigation map for you. If this is going forward. No. This is the fun part. Okay. Yes, yes, no, no, we can, we can. Okay, now it's good. Okay. So my navigation map has four elements. And the first one is uh, about Anthropocene and about the direction. When we look at at, at system theories, uh, it's often one of the critical uh, uh, criterion that we are going in the right direction. And besides that, there are no other forces which are taking you uh, to wrong direction. Uh, I know Anthropocene is kind of contested concept. It's putting uh, uh, human first uh, in a way. But uh, I think uh, if we frame this Anthropocene, the era, geological era of, of human as the guiding principle of, of all decision making, uh, then we, on our map, we know the direction. Uh, I will come back to this later. The second part is to know your terrain or know your waters. Some waters are stormy, some more calm, but if you want to navigate, you have to understand uh, where and with whom you navigate. And in a way, it's clear that there are different perceptions about uh, whether we should change the world or, or not. And then if yes, how to do it slowly or more radically. And we could call these different uh, different perspectives, we could call them competing social blocks. And, uh, and then it's obvious that uh, we should somehow anyway collaborate. If we start fighting against each other or these social blocks start fighting against each other, we are not going to solve this very complex challenge. Uh, the third element is for navigation is that you need skills. Uh, you have to learn how to navigate. And it seems uh, that we don't possess, uh, maybe as individuals or especially as society, we don't possess all those necessary skills for how we navigate this new normal, this complex uh, sustainable transformation. And it's not just about, you know, educational system, formal education from primary schools to universities. It's the whole society who should be learning new transformative qualities and also unlearn those some old qualities or, or skills which we have, which in a way have led us to this situation. And the fourth element is that actually we also have to look inside uh, into ourselves. 
we are all nested in different systems or subsystems. We have, we have our family, we have our work, we have our leisure time. Uh, we are connected globally and locally uh, to different communities. And actually maybe one stepping stone in this navigation uh, that it's okay, you can only do that kind of navigation where you trust yourself and you know that you are not going to you know get lost in in your navigation or, or you know end up in in a in a dire situation and and one one part of that is maybe re the recognition that there seems to be some true goal conflicts which we all face and maybe we should somehow deal with those uh, now since uh i have maybe 20 minutes more left to go uh i'm not obviously able to go i'm not able to go very deeply in this but i will give you some ideas uh what actually is behind this navigation map more details so anthropocene oh now this is very problematic this small screen is hiding my navigation map Okay, now you can see that we are talking about Anthropocene. So we are on that page of, of the map. Uh, oh, I, I, uh, I'm sorry, I promised I'm not talking about uh, the analysis for that tree environment. But anyway, this is a bit different. So I, it's not climate change and biodiversity loss, and, uh, but it's, it's a bit different what I think what are the environment, may, our main environmental problems. And I would label them, or someone else has actually labeled them, uh, as materialism, asymmetrical power relations, and uh, locking of exploitative and extractive systems. So again, when we are looking at this planet as a system, maybe uh, these things are uh, so-called root drivers. If we are looking, uh, if we are trying to solve the climate crisis, we are in a way solving the root cause of the system. So uh, we have destabilized the climate by uh, excess amount of uh, carbon, carbon uh, emissions into atmosphere, but that's the cause uh, due to fossil fuel use. But the driver and all uh, the system theory again says that uh, if you look for leverage, you have to look for root drivers. And maybe these uh, three things are the root drivers why uh, we are in this anthropogenic situation in the first place. And by addressing these root drivers, we have potentially much more leverage uh, to the right direction. Um, Social metabolism is uh, a co concept which, in a way, explains uh, uh, takes takes from the biology or 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 from 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 biological sciences and moves that concept of metabolism to societal level. And uh, I'm here maybe cutting some corners but uh, often when you are dealing with complex systems you have to cut corners a little bit not too much to find out uh, some proxies which explain how your system behaves and uh, i'm thinking uh, luckily i'm not alone that material footprint so the amount uh, of materials extracted from the nature would be a good fairly good proxy for social metabolism. So this, these gigatons here, they, they are global figures. If we take Finnish figure and put it per person, it's something like 40 tons. Uh, and well, what is the sustainable level? We can argue on that. Maybe it's the eight tons, what's been described in, in literature. But anyway, the point here, maybe from the systems perspective is that our social metabolism, if we accept this, that, uh, Material footprint is a proxy, uh, like gross domestic product is proxy for economic activity uh, or level of economic activity. So we are 
our social metabolism is growing. And what happens when metabolism grows? Well, I mean, more and more material stays in economy. So economy gets fatter. So what we need in Anthropocene, actually, this would be if, you know, I'm in a way visioning a situation that when the Ministry of Finance or whatever it's called in the future makes its yearly report that, okay, our economy stagnated by 0.5%. Uh, but luckily, our material footprint reduced by 2%. So we are on the right track. Uh, this, uh, that is something which I think should start leading our decisions. And adding to this, this uh, material footprint as it stands now, maybe 25% of this is climate related. Since fossil fuels are maybe approximately 20 to 25% of global material flows. Thereby, this is also a fairly good proxy for our uh, energy transition. So if we get rid of those fossil fuel material flows, it will be visible here, these curves turn down. Before that, any you know, so-called clean energy does not reduce our metabolism unless we are able to cut down the fossil fuel flows. Okay, so that was five minutes for Anthropocene. Now about social blocks uh, and, uh, and, and collaboration or competition. And I would like to hear pose a question which you all know to answer. So are uh, I, my original education or major which I studied in my master's degree was, was, was business strategy and so I took the liberty of, of using the principal concept of strategy. It's two times two matrix. And uh, uh, it's clear uh, that there is a tension or division between how we interpret the word sustainability or progress towards sustainability. It's uh, the typical way, maybe the dominant way is the weak sustainability, which might be labeled also as a political sustainability. We have these three pillars and we think, okay, economy is going fine, environment not so well, but we are in, it's reasonable. And then the strong, maybe systemic sustainability could also be used here. Uh, so where you cannot, certain, certain types of capital, like natural capital is not replaceable with other types of capital. And the other action, uh, axis here is uh, whether there is action or inaction. And now I've taken lots of liberties and grouped uh, the world in four groups. So uh, it's easy to understand that the conservative populist uh, fraction is, uh, is happy with the weak sustainability and inaction. And it's clear that there is maybe growingly radical group and number of, of radical activists who uh, act and take a strong sustainability perspective. But it's not so straightforward uh, since we also apparently have this successful elite, which many of us here represent as well, or uh, many of our con connections reflect. So it's about this green growth. We continue the success what we have had in the past, uh, but and there is action, and we see, uh, you know, action towards sustainability. But the interpretation of sustainability remains weak, or political, or opportunistic. Just choose your word, and uh, it's so we have to that group of, of people have a different strategy. Then uh, I put a question mark there, but maybe uh, research community is relatively good in analyzing what is paralyzing the world and why things are not going in the right direction. But uh, I might call a bit more action from uh, you fellow researchers to move to the direction of action. Uh, as uh, the strategy textbooks are saying that if 
uh, its, its strategy is about getting from the present situation to the vision or the goal you are aiming for. And if your uh, actions are adequate, you have to take more radical action, take more, make more action. So by using this very simple translation, it seems that since we are not achieving our sustainability goals, we should take more action and more radical action. That's about social flow. No, I have still, uh, it's, uh, I was listening to the previous session in this room about hope and false hopes. And, 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 uh, and uh, uh, it was quite interesting. Uh, I did, uh, and in a way, I'm just sit, sit, sat down, used one or two minutes to think about some positive words. What could be those elements of, of, of a positive vision, which all those social blocks, which I described in, uh, in the previous one, would share. And I came up with the following list. Uh, may, maybe not everyone is agreeing with all of these, but there are very few people, at least in this room, but if we take also these other social blocks, uh, I might argue that no one is against these, uh, these elements. If we say that the world in the future is more, it's more fair, every, everything, everyone has sufficient of sufficient well, level of, of income and well-being, more healthy, more safe, natural communities are thriving, and you can be curious. Maybe that's a bit overdressed, but otherwise. Uh, so in a way, it's rather easy to build up a positive vision. Uh, then, of course, it's much more complicated to get this vision uh, a reality. And now the third element of, of, of the navigation map. Do we have the skills? You might uh, also, uh, also understand my Answer for this, uh, we don't, apparently we don't have the skills. This has been um, an extensive field of study in, uh, in, in, in sustainable education field. And it's quite clear what actually, what kind of skills should individuals and also groups of individuals, organizations and institutions possess. Uh, and all these words in one form or another, I think have been now, you know, flashing in my, in this, even in my short presentation here. So we, we need, or every individual uh, in or needs, in order to sustainable transformation to uh, become reality, needs more systems thinking, needs futures thinking, values thinking or ethical thinking, if that's a better word for that, strategic thinking, and collaboration skills. So, uh, and I, if you look of, of the formal education system, maybe you see some elements of this, but this is not the leading principle of how we design our, our formal education. And if you go to uh, uh, work life or, or some other societal sectors, maybe some of these are present, but I don't see this kind of systemic appearance of these necessary skills. Okay, that's about skills in this navigation map. And my final element in this navigation map uh, is uh, us, we as individuals. And now just think for a second, who makes the tough decisions? Who are, who are those people who make those decisions what we need, uh, whether it's an investment or change of policy or uh, change of educational system or change of anything. Typically, those people are those who are in power because they have the power of making the decisions. And what do those people who are in power have? They typically have a fairly good income. And uh, you have seen this before, most likely. But uh, just think most of the decision makers in the world belong to the top. 10% uh, richest people. And, and on average, their environmental footprint is uh, 
much higher than with those who have less uh, income or wealth. Actually, the correlation between wealth and, wealth and income and environmental footprint is very straightforward, close, uh, close to one. Uh, but we could just, this is again imagination, uh, but if, let's assume that this richest 10% by of many of who are, of us are in the room belong to, uh, would cut their uh, carbon footprints to European average, which I think we all consider it's, it's reasonable. So we, could, we would get rid of one third of global emissions. So here we clearly see this has been spoken in the today and in other uh, in other similar similar occasions with different words. But this is this is you know in Finnish we have the saying "kierta kun kissa kuuma purot" cut circular around a hot oatmeal uh, and not. <laughs> so where uh, you cannot uh, cannot uh, um, avoid this discussion, this is uh, unless we solve this kind of, of, of tension or the, nest, the nested situation the decision makers have, uh, so they should actually cut something from themselves, we are not able to get there. So, uh, I'm, and this is the true goal conflict, which I think uh, I mentioned in the beginning. Okay, and now my final slide. Uh, so out of all this, I created a model. This is also, you know, from, from the time of my business studies, to always create something 3P for marketing price product place. And, uh, but I created 4S uh, for sustainable transformation. The first S, Anthropocene, the scale, always, when dealing with sustainability science issues, the sky, scale, understanding the scale, uh, whether it's adequate or sufficient, or uh, is is of critical importance. So keep in mind always the scale, in positive and in negative sense. Then your navigation starts going in the right direction. Strategy. So strategy for collaboration maybe but of course in this kind you have to have only one word you cannot explain this too long so we need a strategy uh for for this navigation between competing social blocks and the skills this was the most tricky one so but i put it self so we have to uh we have to understand ourselves so uh, and be you know in harmony with our our uh, our schizophrenic situation all right that was my very brief uh re cocktail uh, uh happy hour Got to put it back into the charger. Um, thank you so much for those amazing words. All right, everyone. Unfortunately, there's no time for questions. No, I'm just joking. I'm just joking. Call back to this morning. Um, we now have time for questions, a good amount of time for questions and discussion. So um, if anybody would like to ask a question in the room, please raise your hand right down here first. Thank you for that uh, inspiring talk um, and also showing us a mirror, us researchers, a mirror on where we are standing, uh, you know, strong systemic sustainability, but in action. So I would like to ask, um, what does it mean, in your opinion, to take more action and more radical action in, with and through research? Mm. Well, it obviously means many things, and there are many forums uh, with many stakeholders. So it's, I mean, but 
uh, I think at least one, I mean, and all, of course, always we are saying that start from somewhere and go forward. Uh, I don't, I, I just maybe go on streets, maybe once a while, maybe once a week. Uh, I, no, no. So, I, I mean, it's, I think we need a critical evaluation of with how actually to get this message through. And I don't think it's not, I mean, uh, I'm now head of, 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 of or chair of, of uh, science panel for sustainable development. And there are now the governmental negotiations going on uh, for the new government in Finland. We were not even invited for discussions what kind of sustainability strategy the new government should have. Uh, so in a way, there is a lot of room for activism in every form. I, but I think, I don't know if I answered your question, but everyone can do many things. Over to Susanna. Thank you. Uh, I could continue on that a bit because uh, I paid attention to the, uh, the mirror also, and I paid attention to, to the fact that you even had the question mark there and to the fact that you verbalized it like I might call fellow my fellow researchers to more action, which signified to me a lot of like, um, uh, how, how, how can I say it? like, very uh, uh, subtle way of saying that maybe we should do something. I might call you for a little bit action. So, and, and, and I think that that is uh, interesting because I think that's one of the things that many scientists, us do, that we are really not bold enough to take the stage and claim uh, for transformation or something like that. So. Why did you express yourself so delicately and, and, and how to break out from this, uh, uh, what, what is it, shy, shy, bubble of shyness? Yeah, okay. I, you know, I was a bit uh, inconvenient of putting only research community in that corner. So I was, in a way, I tried to hedge a little bit. Maybe it went over. The question there was a continuation: How to break out of that bubble of shyness for our online? Let's maybe we all should learn more of these transformative skills. More about values. More about uh, more about collaboration. More about uh, 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 think about strategies. How to uh, how to influence and then go for it. So in a way, in a way, uh, uh, operationalize what we know. Uh, that's easy to say. All right, let's go to the back. Thank you, Mikko Jalasalta University. I would like to ask Lassi you about the notion of uh, root causes. I, I sorry, sorry, what? Okay, so uh, Mikko Jalasalta University, I would like to ask you about the notion of root causes. Uh, I think it's very tempting to say that there are some kind of like sweet spots to to really have a lot of leverage and i'm wondering that is this kind of a bit opposite to the morning's plenary uh, of of andy sterling uh saying that there is no cockpit there's no uh strategy uh, uh grand strategy and i even wonder that would this kind of root cause thinking prevent people from taking action so action is quite difficult if you if you kind of maybe are too careful in, in thinking of, of, you know, what is the best place to start and so on and so forth. So would you agree with that? And uh, and what does the root cause, you know? Okay, so it's... Uh, mean yeah, for you. Yeah, yeah. I, uh, that's that's a good point. I saw Andy's slides, I didn't hear his presentation. And uh, I don't think it's conflicting. Actually, we have to make a difference between root causes like climate change or biodiversity loss and root drivers, which drive these root causes. And my uh, stance was that unless we address root drivers, we actually will see this kind of system level rebound and we end up getting fatter in social metabolism. 
in black there. Thank you for the presentation. Uh, I'm very interested in this 4S model to navigate sustainable transformation. Who are you targeting for to use the uh, 4S model? Uh, uh, I, I'm asking this because from uh, what I see uh, from uh, from a social work background, I I I I I would imagine, uh, for example, for those uh, for those people who with well with resource well with power they can easily work from the self perspective but for those without uh will they be covered uh with the 4s model somehow well uh i think when i was uh crafting this the idea was my idea was how to influence decision making on whatever level of course then your interpretation of these different s letters is a bit different but it's this is for decision making or decision makers, what I had in mind at least. Thank you. All right, and then we're gonna come down here. Thank you for a really interesting presentation. Uh, my name is Christopher Södlund Connorp, and I'm from SLU in Sweden. And I, I really agree with this presentation. I think it was really excellent. Uh, and I, my question is about scale. And I, I totally agree about the, the scale part, but I was wondering why why focus on the Anthropocene as a term? And my, my thinking here was that if we understand it more as a political or mental state, then it might be something that we need to move away from seeing humanity as the epicenter and see it more as part of a part of nature rather than the center. And if we think about it as the geological era, like the more, um, then shouldn't we aim to not be the driving force? So in both cases, the Anthropocene as a driving concept here might be problematic. Or so what is what is the use uh, of I, I, okay? Uh I took is granted that we are now in Anthropocene, not contesting that. And my extrapolation or simplification for Anthropocene is that we, humanity has created huge amount of material flows, actually the flows or, or, or the material flows of humanity created by, I mean, the inorganic material flows surpass the flows of biomass or, or, or generated by planet Earth itself. So in a way, then the proxy for uh, material flows is in a way that was my way of trying to get a single measure which if we start following and you know contract it go down with it then basically so basically what you were also saying that we should get rid of anthropocene but uh, okay i think we don't disagree then the question was why is it so important to say that we're to continue with the, you could just say that we need to get out of the Anthropocene rather than where. Thanks for uh, helping me with my with my wordings. <laughs> All right, we in the orange shirt here. Maybe we'll come around, bring it that way. Good audience participation. Thank you for that mic passing. So uh, I'm Juliana, uh, also from uh, studying at Out University. And I would uh, like to continue with the question about scale. So first of all, thank you for your presentation and thank you for the organizers because it was amazing to have your speech, your lecture at the end of this day. Just like it was really, really nice. And in this sense, I would like to ask you to elaborate a little bit more about scale because I'm a little bit skeptical on scale in this sense, especially when you say about Anthropocene. Isn't that the matter that we need to descale many things and uh, try to also um, reinforce some local resilient, um, vibrant communities? And in this sense, I also uh, go back to the graph that you shared that so many, uh, when you say now, like the humanity, humanity creates a lot of material and how this creates the Anthropocene, we cannot say that the whole humanity did that because actually many communities around the world are resistant and protecting natural environments and so on. So in this sense, 
isn't our obsession with scale that some, many times are translated by how to increase in numbers are actually in the service of that weak sustainability uh, action that changes a lot of things to change nothing in the end? Uh, I was thinking in system systemic terms and when you are saying scale, I mean, I'm of course I'm uh, I'm, I agree with you that we have to descale many things, uh, but we have, and especially that, therefore we have to understand the scale. What so it's uh, uh, in 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 that sense. So it I didn't I hope I didn't send a message that we should scale everything up, but it's it it was about understanding the scale and what what actions we are taking. And it's clear we have to scale down from many things. But it's if it's it doesn't in a way. Let's uh, let's take another example, not fossil fuels, but it doesn't help scale up, you know, alternative proteins uh, for diets if we don't scale down at the same time and even faster the amount of meat we consume. So it it doesn't help to bring alternatives unless the scale uh, is not reduced in uh, in other uh, domains. So that's in a way, so only absolute global terms uh, matter when we take the planet Earth as, 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 as an observation point. All right, and we have a quick question from the chat and then, so coming from the chat, uh, they would like to know how does navigating this, how is navigating the sustainable transformation in line with the disadvantage using the 4S model? Now it's getting complicated. Ooh, big question, big question from the chat. <laughs> uh, uh, in a way, uh, so I might, after this feedback, I haven't been presenting this elsewhere. So maybe I get rid of the first one and explain the navigation a bit differently. And I start using these letters only. And then I saw a question right there. Hi, I'm Jan de Halme from uh, Aalto University, and um, yeah, I try to ask something simple. And um, because I'm a physicist, I like simplifying things. And you had this one slide, and maybe if you can bring that up again, where you showed the uh, distribution, uh, the wealthy people producing uh, this one thirty-two percent of the global emissions, or we could uh, there's a potential of reducing mm -hmm. by that amount. I wasn't able to grasp your thinking there, but it gave me this thought, and maybe you could comment about that. So I wonder how, what they could, what they should do, what they could do to reach that emission reduction. Because as far as I can, just in a simplified way, understand this, the only way they hate how they could consume their wealth would be to pay for someone who makes their products or services that they consume. And by default, those people would be EU average. So is there a way around that if they consume their wealth? Uh, investments also create an impact, a positive or negative. Uh, so, uh... I think if I get your not so simple question right, uh, I think it's about reducing consumption from the top of the pyramid. That's so sufficient consumption levels for all means that if uh, we have limited resources, if we want to make, uh, you know, bring the pyramid bottom of the pyramid up, we have to cut from the top of the pyramid. And this is one of the uh, topics which uh, I mean, uh, we, so far, our societies have assumed or still assume that you can consume what you have obtained. And now this is in a way just a play with figures. Of course, I'm, I don't know how to do this. It's rather complicated. It's the, yeah, I try to be very simply simple minded here just to point out that what you what for them not to consume would mean that they should not be rich. Good point. Now you get it. All right. And we will go to the back for our last question. 
Thank you. Uh, Janne Hukinen from the University of Helsinki. <clears throat> you can keep that slide up and it's a continue. It's an environmental policy question. And it, I, I'll try to link it with the recent populist, populist uh, right wing movement. Uh, isn't the environmental policy implication here that you could actually target all the policy actions on the 10% and forget all that, the, the 90%. And, and that way, I think we would stop bothering 90% of people with this silly sustainability message. Putting the scales in action, that might be the implication, yes. Un unfortunately, yes. If, if we want, to, I mean, uh, you know, Aikuisten oikeasti, if we try to solve this, uh, this is an issue to be addressed. And you cannot, you know, circulate around the hot oatmeal and not pretend that it's not there. So, of course, it's not, uh, you, you also know as a professor of environmental policy that it's not so straightforward. 